What's up, everybody, and welcome to episode 175 of Two Amazon Sellers and a Microphone, brought to you by Solozo and Netrush. And uh, today, this is going to be a ton of fun. Uh, we always love when we can just pick the brains of other sellers, find their journey, learn what they did, learn some tactics and tips and strategies that they employ. Uh, so today is going to be a ton of fun. We've got Michael Cobb, the founder of Dizzy Toys, on with us. What's up, Michael? How are you? Hey, doing well. Thanks for having me. Excited to get into it. <clears throat> we are too. We, we love it. And I know you've got um, just some great stories of, of what you've done. Uh, so we can't wait to get into all that and then just pick your brain on just some tactics and strategies that you've employed uh, to get you to your level of success that you've uh, enjoyed. So we are super glad that you're here. Um, so why don't we just kick it off? Why don't you, you, you take as much time as you want. We'd love to sort of hear your journey to sort of how you got into e-commerce in the first place, what you're doing before, yeah. and just take us through sort of your journey. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so it started, geez, four, five years ago, probably now. Um, and a buddy of mine and I, we launched together and it was kind of just based off of the idea of, of sort of like, why not? Um, he at the time worked at Amazon and he was helping um, small sellers in their um, handmaids section kind of ramp up and scale. So he had a lot of Amazon knowledge through that. And then I worked at an ad agency at the time, but had um, familiarity with like social listening, a lot of research techniques, tools to do that, um, access to a creative studio that was was nice. So we kind of looked at each of our our worlds professionally and we're like hey we think we can we can do something selling products um unsure what that was at the time so we just kind of went into it saying hey we want to be um small sellers um so started off like okay what do we want to sell um and we kind of just set out some basic requirements on okay we're going to compete in a space that has no major brand competition i uh, don't want to go against that no amazon white label brands as just a, a place to uh, avoid um, we wanted a low product moat at the time we were early in our twenties, didn't have a ton of like seed funding or anything like that. So it was all bootstrapped. Um, and then a, a decent, um, size like sales category. So kind of chipping through that one by one, we, uh, you know, landed on dog toys, long story short, um, for a variety of reasons that fit the criteria in all those places. And, um, neither of us owned a dog at the time, but just tons of friends, family, coworkers, um, all, all were dog people and it, it just felt like a something we could have fun with and um, kind of enter in and make an impact and, and have a bit of a community to spark that initial sale, those initial reviews out the gate um, to really kind of up level us, um, you know, and build that momentum right off the start. Um, so yeah, that, that was the, the initial thing. And then I guess like as far as the product development goes and all that, we we looked at some of the top sellers on Amazon and just like unpack their SERP pages. And we're trying to just figure out um, what we could do better. So all the toys we've made, we've kind of taken a creative approach and okay, rope toys do really well, but plush toys do really well. Dogs love the plush toys, but owners hate how they break. Um, so the, the two primary toys we've built, one is a, a plush toy that wraps around a rope and we call that the dizzy duck. And it's just like a long, <laughs> phallic looking duck that <laughs> um is it kind of it, it's a funny looking product which actually like helps some of the reviews and people have fun with it like oh the dizzy duck um and then the second one is the dizzy hedgehog but it's a ball with a hedgehog uh wrapped around it so it kind of is these two for one toys that that stand out um so we could look at a popular plush toy and say hey we'll just make this better with um a bit more functionality make it more durable um, and then started to build, test, iterate products around that. Um, and yeah, it, it helped us get there pretty quickly. Um, we also found that on Alibaba, the manufacturers that um, we could see listed some of the top sellers on Amazon. So we knew they were making um, dog toys, at least, of uh, you know, high enough quality to, to enter the market. Um, and that, yeah. How did you get the, like, I know you talked about the idea, but like, how did you come up with the idea of, like wrapping something around a ball, like and make it yeah. like, like, where'd this, yeah. where'd this product innovation come from? Uh, honestly, like talking to dog owners in, in one, just like what annoys you about dog toys, you know, like, um, but then also just like 
playing playing with dogs like we joked about like the product market research we do but it's literally like get a bunch of cheap toys and just like sit and play with like our friends dogs of different sizes different ages and just kind of see what they they gravitated towards um so a, a bit of a, a canine focus group kind of helped get us there and then just you know kind of riffing off of each other i'm um, just talking through you know hey what can we do and it um it opened itself kind of naturally and organically what was the supplier like? So like, I'm, I'm sure this oh. item, some of this item didn't exist. You had to kind of like create it on your own. What was that flow like, communication like? Yeah, it was. So initially it was reaching out to them through Alibaba just to make a connection. Um, and then we um, kind of shared some design ideas. Um, we had somebody, a CAD designer we hired on the side of just Fiverr to help kind of diagram what we wanted. It's probably overkill honestly, for the simplicity of the toy, um, but kind of gave them an idea. And it, it probably took a year, honestly, of them sending a prototype. Um, we'd look at it. Hey, we need the rope to be bigger. We need less plush. We need double stitching here, like all these little things. So we got tons of different dog toys that we would give to friends, let their dogs just tear it apart. And then we'd kind of get feedback. And, you know, over time, we, we got to a pretty solid product. What was that first order like? So you, you've got the samples yeah. done, you've got everything ready to roll, you got the, the name. Yeah. We uh so the first order we put in, it was a 1000 unit minimum order quantity. And we we thought that would give us a pretty good runway. And it it was exciting, you know, we, you have it all and at the time we shipped in like I don't know, 300 or so to FBA. Um and what we didn't anticipate, like the scale of Amazon is, is just massive, obviously. And we had a pretty good game plan on how to get like our, our initial community to um, start ranking, buying and all of that. And it, we got into like near trouble really quickly. Like it, it took off way quicker than we expected. So we had to like fly in product on like a, a second order, like pretty darn quick to, to make sure we didn't run out, like right out the gate and just, you know, stutter a quarter mile off the finish line kind of thing. What um, was that strategy like? What, what what's that strategy? So market goes yeah. or product goes live. What do you do? Yeah, we it was literally like talking to friends and family. Um, like, hey, here's our product. Here's a link. Um, kind of a a scrappy even like rebate for people. Like, we'll we'll give you the money back if you buy it, but please buy, leave a review, leave pictures. Um, fortunately, the product was was great. People loved it. Um, so then a lot of them started to repurchase too, but it was getting, you know, a hundred or so people out the gate, like actually engaged with the product and then being able to take that kind of forward and build that momentum. Um, yeah. So I guess having that network out the, the gate kind of organized and helping people come along the journey with testing and iterating product kind of, kind of help them care enough to, to jump. Sure. Through that. Yeah, sure. you mentioned your buddy that started with you worked at Amazon in like the handmade section. Yeah, did his past knowledge have any help here with like yeah he, creating he, listings and all that? Yeah, definitely. Um, setting up the page, making sure we got the the details and the photo stuff, like all of that, like a lot of the best practices that you pick up online too. I was just kind of tribal knowledge to him, so we we had like high quality product shots. Um, we knew we had to sort of the the tools of you know, maintaining a good brand on Amazon, um, having proper inventory, paying into the the ads and like that pay to play to get the boosting and, you know, kind of all those things. We we had an idea out the gate and it was really getting that spark of buys and reviews to get us over that initial edge from, you know, the tons of sellers who hardly get any anything because they're way off that first page. So it's kind of like, OK, let's get first page on plush dog toys. And we think we'll be in a pretty good spot to to scale and maintain from there. I want to go back and unpack a little bit of the beginning because what you mentioned is very interesting. What year did you launch on Amazon? It would have been, let's see, 20, 2016. Okay. You've, you took a slightly different approach than a lot of people, especially a lot of people that we, Chris and I both talk with uh, on a daily basis. You know, a lot of people you mentioned you wanted to stay away from categories that had, you know, well-recognized brands. You wanted to stay away from uh, products that 
Amazon was playing in that niche also because yeah. they, you know, they can kill you on price. A lot of those are really good approaches because a lot of times what people will do is they'll use tools for product research and just immediately enter a super hot, super competitive market. Yeah. And then they fail on the next steps because it's so saturated. Yeah. Um, what made you take that approach? Was it, was it knowledge, more knowledge of the space or you just were yeah. really looking to create a creative brand? Uh, a little of both. I think it was some knowledge of the, the space. And then um, like in my, my day job, um, working in like um, analytics and research within the advertising space, just kind of accustomed to, to looking at markets, landscapes, trying to figure out where a beachhead might be for a, a big brand um, through the angle of like, what story can you tell? How can you message differently? Um, but very kind of tuned into how to find sort of that, that white space. Um, so just using that same mindset into taking it into the e-commerce space, sort of just kind of had us grounded in like, hey, let's be realistic and figure out where we can compete. And, mm -hmm. you know, put put ego or interest aside on, you know, I love golf, but I, I wasn't like, we need to sell golf things, you know? Um, so it just kind of like letting the, the, the data and a bit of just sort of like your, your intuition or your feel for, for how things are looking kind of come together to, to point you on that initial product and, you know, yeah. a test and iterate mindset too, you know, if we, if we whiffed, that would have sucked on that first MOQ, but you know, whatever it, it's, um, not that big of a, an order end of the day. I think it's so important for anybody who's listening right now that is in the beginning stages of their journey to follow that advice. Um, you you really, it's so, especially if you have a limited budget, it's so hard to launch into those competitive areas and you just, it's, it's most likely going to fail for yeah. actors that are outside of your control. You, it's finding that right niche. When, when you were launching, was your plan to make Amazon the dominant platform? For your sales or did you have d to c sites built out were you yeah what was the game plan there like where was your yeah. focus great question so we went into it with the anticipation at least for the first year to be amazon exclusive um and just kind of get traction there get you know product market fit proof of concept and then from there kind of get to the point hey do we want to go more d to c do we want to um you know build out a, a, a brand on social like all those things um so and we we've, we've kind of stuck to a a very light e-commerce model since it's been amazon only for most of the time we switched during the pandemic um for a, kind of a, a couple things came together but we sell on wholesale to rover.com now is kind of a, a pivot we took through the pandemic to get through some of the fba changes but um we we've been able to to stay e-commerce you know, without too much effort um, and, and not had to take on the, the building the GDC brand quite yet, actually. Let's talk about Rover. How's that going? It's it's going well. Uh, it's so much easier. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's there. the difference? What's some differences there? Um, so work with uh, a friend of mine just in my network. She happened to, to get a job at Rover. And then as they built up their store, she was familiar with the Dizzy Toy um, options and was like, hey, we're looking to get products in our store. Um, do you guys want to sell wholesale? We're like, well, you know, might as well. And it really comes down to, hey, can you send us, you know, 500 units? Um, and they'll they'll hold the inventory. Um, and we get roughly the same margins as we do on Amazon because they're taking away all the FBA fees. Um, and they they manage inventory and then let us know, you know, a couple months out, hey, we're we're getting getting lower. Um, time to you know get a new order ready. So it's um, send, let them handle the inventory and everything, and kind of wait and see on, on when that next one comes in, but it, it's about a quarterly refresh is sort of the pace we've gone on. Is that a strategy that you're going to continue to employ looking for other partners and marketplaces and other well, where areas to sell your product? Uh, po yeah, potentially. Um, if it makes sense, like Rover's a great one. They, they're a great like aggregator of, of people, you know, of, of pet mm -hmm. owners. So it was a nice fit where the, the marketplace was already built up, um, able to scale and has the, the right audience. Um, I like, I don't think anytime soon we'd go to say like a, a Walmart's not on our roadmap right now, just um, at our scale between Amazon and Rover, we can, 
we can do enough. You know, um, that's, we've, we've talked about and we still might look for like local opportunities at, um, you know, different kind of Seattle pet stores that are, are not national chains, um, but we, we think we could enter those potentially, um, but has, haven't done it quite yet. But I, I think that would be like the next growth route for us to just kind of go a little bit more boutique on the retail side if we were to go the wholesaler route. What about um, after your initial launch, what was your strategy on continuing to launch new products? Are you are you doing that? Is, is your SKU count growing or what's the focus? Yeah, so we've we've kept the kept our SKU count to just two two toys, the hedgehog and the, the dizzy duck. Um, and then we we have a couple things in the pipeline. One is like a, a V2 version of the dizzy duck, but it's been out there long enough. Um, and we we can we have like a way to make it better, more durable in a couple different sizes. Um, so big dog, small dog, medium dog type variety um, as kind of a natural way to build that out. Um, and then there's, <laughs> this one's kind of funny, it's outside of the dog toy space, but it's something that we, we're, we're working on. We think it'll be kind of a fun gimmicky thing, but you know, the uh, croquis, right? Mm -hmm. yes. um, so it's kind of like that, but have you seen like the corny visors that have a wig on top, right? Yeah. So it's like a croquis, but with a, a rat tail. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> um so like little i don't know we have a couple of fun things like like that that we think would you know just get the right people to to buy that and kind of has a, a viral aspect to it um mm -hmm. but we, we this past year with the um fba changes and not being able to to send in a lot of quantity all at once um kind of we've we've held off on on investing into new products but more just kind of keeping status quo as, as this whole pandemic sorts itself out. Let's talk about navigating some of those FBA changes. I mean, this was, I think this threw everybody for a loop. I think it wasn't, mm -hmm. obviously the pandemic was not expected, yeah. uh, which, which goes to show you should be expected for, you should expect any kind of crazy thing to happen. Um, but I mean, it's, it was so different. 2016, when you start, you could have sent in, 20,000 units. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Amazon could have been your warehouse. They're, yep. If they were even charging fees, then I'm not even sure, it, that, but it, it was wasn't good. much. It was minimal, yeah. It was minimal. Um, there was a point where there weren't long-term storage fees. Um, you could just really use it as a warehouse, um, but that clearly is not the case now. So when this shift happened, what were you guys doing to help navigate I mean, these limited, yeah. you know, inventory amounts you could send in. Yeah, good question. So we, at the beginning, we kind of like focused on just like as a, a blueprint for making sure we could, you know, be profitable. It was just the, the unit economics of um, everything. And then with the, the, the tightrope of kind of keeping low inventory in Amazon, um, but also, um like shipping orders were taking longer and longer to get. So how to like balance the supplier tension with the, the ability to scale on Amazon, we, we pulled back actually. So we um, kind of shipped in smaller, um, smaller deliveries to Amazon, like a hundred units at a time kind of thing, just to, to keep pace is really kind of what we, we moved into. Um, so kind of just maintain status really. Um, and that way we could control our inventory a bit better with the longer lead times of getting it, not have to um, blow our margin on um, shipping stuff via flight. For, um, so all of that kind of played in. So on Amazon, we've dialed back. We're not spending ad bucks or anything on Amazon at the moment and, it, and just letting that kind of maintain itself until this clears itself up. And then fortunately, the Rover thing kind of happened around the same time. So it allowed us to, to pivot and, and push more inventory that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's tough. We're, we're fortunate. We still have our, our day jobs as well. Um, so we, you know, financially it was easier for us to say like, okay, let's, let's go into a bit of a holding pattern and, and wait this out. Um, it versus, you know, if it, if it was the only source of income that we were, were dependent on, that would be some, some tough decisions. <laughs> I think, yeah. And I guess we bought a storage unit or rent one out as, kind of as a filler as well as a small thing, you know, we can have our 
a bit of inventory there um, fairly cheaply and can help sort of balance the load. You you mentioned you've you've got your day job and the I mean that also uh, I'll speak from my personal experience that keep that as long as you can. <laughs> uh, you never you never know. Uh, yeah, it's when something happens and sales velocity changes and all your eggs are in that basket. It can be that can be scary. Um, it I've, yeah. I've lived it. It is scary. Um, what what is your end game? for this venture are you are you guys looking at a future exit or do you yeah. really love this and you want to continue to keep growing it and running it how's good, that look good question um we are looking at um my my business partner on this since then he's switched to be a full-time kind of e-commerce seller on a, a variety of other products with a, a different kind of small group of people Mm -hmm. So he's kind of going all in on a couple different products there. Um, so we're, we're figuring out how to decouple the business and I, I'm going to take it on as the plan, um, maintain it for now. I, the, the Rover connection gives great cover to, um, kind of stay in the holding period. And as things open back up, figure out, um, you know, how to scale it ideas to get a couple more ASINs. And then at, you know, at some point it's, you know, could it be a thing that, that you go full time on? Can it, run itself or, or at least get it to a point where it's big enough to, to sell to somebody else. Um, right now, I don't think we're quite at that, that scale where it would be an attractive like acquisition, but, um, yeah. It's so interesting. I mean, yeah, I, I love stories like this. I love it. And I mean, it, you know, it should be encouraging to a lot of people out there. I mean, that, that are looking to get into this. I mean, it's, it's a very doable business if you take the right mindset, the right approach, like like you've done, and and it doesn't need to be overwhelming. You can be successful with two products. You can be successful with one. I mean, it it can happen for sure. Um, so I I just I love talking about this creative approach to finding products and product development. I mean, yeah. I love that you you know, you did some testing. Are there any other like research tips that you have for people that are looking to find a niche like you did that's potentially underserved and you can get in with your unique products? Yeah. Yeah. A, a couple things. I think one, and this is um, something I, I kind of preach at in my, my day job too, as far as like research goes um, from like a, a data perspective, a lot of times like in formal like statistics training stuff it's like ignore outliers things like um that kind of focus on the mean is is what a lot of sort of um you know standard knowledge teaches you but it I, you know find the the outliers is a little bit you know um if you're looking at a category find things that that surprise you is like just a good um heuristic and for me it's like a signal if something surprises you your worldview is incomplete like something something's out there that you didn't really know is there. So if you are looking at a category or a space and you can just find the things like, holy shit, what's that? Or, you know, anything that surprises you kind of lean in there and, and unpack that. And that's where you kind of might find um, a, a little creative inspiration, some of that white space, um, a new spin on an old category, kind of, you know, anything like that. But I, I think it's really look at outliers actually, because that's where you might find that more outsized opportunity if everybody else is, is zigging and you can find a way to zag um, and searching for the surprises, I guess, as a, a general rule to get there is kind of something I follow. Go ahead, Dustin. <clears throat> you, it sounds like you really enjoy data and analytics and looking through all that. Is there any, like when you're doing this research, what are the main like data points you're looking for? And are there a tool, are there tools that you're using to help yeah. do this? Good, good question. Um, a couple tools. Let's see. Let me pull up. Um, first, like if you're thinking on Amazon, just looking at some of the stuff that's hidden but very um, findable on a, a cert page. So I'm um, saying if there's like um, multiple sellers competing for the buy box. You know, clicking into that and trying to avoid um, products or, or categories that are um, overly competitive. So that's a great way to kind of pick up and get a pulse on on that. Um, looking at 
um, you know, just standard things like price, ratings, volume of ratings, things like that can kind of get a sense of, of quality. Um, and then outside of like Amazon specific pages, I think like I, I have unique access to some tools that help me social listen better than the average person could like um, is is something uh, a trending topic on on Twitter, not always going to be the right signal for for products, you know, people don't talk about dog toys much on Twitter. Um, <laughs> but there, there's ways to pick up on things like that in social still, even if you don't have the tools. Um, like for me, I, I looked at my own Instagram page, um, half for fun, but it was also telling like anytime I had a picture of a, a dog with me, it was like absurd, like 400% more engagements than like, even if I was doing something cool, like a bungee jumping or anything like that, like nobody really gave a crap about any of that. But with the dog, everybody kind of goes nuts to it. So it's like, okay, my people love dogs. So now there's like even just a small community that I can kind of leverage into this this product to kickstart that sales cycle. So anything that you might have your own secret sauce or like a, a community interest to help build some initial momentum with could be, you know, a soft way to, to get there. Um, it's not hard data, but you're, you're still picking up on it in your day to day and kind of intaking that. Um, Google Trends is another good free one potentially, um, and see if you know there's there's search interest in a given product. Um, so those those would be the big areas I'd, I'd look to. Um, so to summarize, I guess scrape the Amazon pages of of would be competitor products and gain as much insight as you can from there. Um, second would be kind of whether it's social or personal data, but kind of cue your 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 world and where you live in and where there's excitement, where there's engagement um, and, and kind of use that as a proxy for, for where you might have um, some naturally organic kind of built in interest around what you might build. And then third one, you can kind of look at that mac macro view of, of Google trends um, to get a, a sense of, you know, maybe the, the broader society or people interested in, in this product. Is it a growing interest? Is it declining? Um, and start to unpack some of that. Is there anything that you would change differently than when you first started? Um, you know, looking back, yeah. you've went through a lot. Is there something that you're like, oh, I wish I would have pivoted this way? Yeah, I would have. Um, once we and we did this pretty quickly and started, um, you know, buying the ads and, and had a, a good keyword strategy around all that. But it, it, it worked too well, almost like we weren't ready to scale as quick. So we had to. Um, you know, rush in a, a new order. Um, and then even then at one point we had to up our price to to way higher than it any rational person would buy it at to to prevent ourselves from going, you know, out of inventory and, and getting the the deranking because of that. So um it's sort of it's a tough balance to to walk, but be ready to scale quickly. Um it would be something I would tell myself um sooner, like um and it's hard to have that that confidence without the hindsight, but um, at least have a plan on how, how you can get product fast if you need it. And, you know, that way, you, if you step on the gas, you can keep on going and, and not de-accelerate and um, slow your, your roll down unintentionally. That's, that's a great tip. I mean, the, a lot of people would say, how can it becoming popular quick or sales vo velocity scaling quick be a problem, but it can be a big problem. Um, yeah. I mean, you may not have the capital to now lay out for a much, much, much larger order. Um, yep. Obviously, it's going to take time to get there. You don't want to go out of stock. There's so many yep. factors. But yeah, building up, building out that plan, making sure that you've got the capital, not just for your initial test order, but the capital um, and the plan in place to get ready to go for that second yep. order. Yeah. So that that was good and for us too. We we've never taken out credit for anything, but. Um, you know, after after running it successfully for a while, we're at a place now we we could. But you know, having an idea on how to to get access to credit early on, I think would have been something that would have benefited us too when we started to have that confidence and be able to scale a bit quicker. Um, would have been probably a, a better move. Um, but you know, it wasn't really something where a project we thought out the gate. Yeah, let's take on on debt. You know, within the first year on this. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. That can be a little risky. 
I think. Yeah, Chris, that, that was our, our idea. Yeah, first. Some good stories on those. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Those Amazon, those yeah. Amazon loans aren't fake money. That's real money. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, I mean, there, and for anyone starting today, there's so many more tailor made opportunities for funding that mm -hmm. fit this model so much better than like in 2016. Or, I mean, yeah, like an been. installment loan. <laughs> or anything like that is just difficult to operate with in mm. this kind of business. I mean, you just might not have the money back in time um, yeah. to, to pay those. But but yeah, I mean, that ability to scale faster if you have access to to credit, there's certainly it can if, if you're following the steps right, you can absolutely do that. This is yeah. yeah. There's so much to talk about. I mean, there's so many factors in play. What yeah. I think we got, everyone who's listening now, we ought to tell them how can they go buy your dog toys. I uh, mean, there's okay. going to be a lot of dog. Uh, oh yeah. Toys, so then they I might get these amazing toys. I how can they go buy them? Drop a link in. But Rover.com is the best place to get them right now at the Rover store. Um, and let's see. Do we have a chat in this or? Uh, you can, if, you, if you look for the Dizzy Hedgehog on on the the Rover.com store, you'll, yeah. you'll find it there um, in the the fetch dog toy section. Yeah, I typed in Dizzy dog toys in Google and found it pretty quickly. It's really All cool right. looking too. Yeah, they're, they're fun little whimsical things. <laughs> the dogs love them. <laughs> so with the squeaker toy as well. Yeah, yeah. So it squeaks, um, not not overly obnoxiously. It, so mm -hmm. it's a firmer ball, so the dog has to get a good good grip on it to to puncture through to get that squeak. But um, yeah, good for fetch, good for for nine, and and all the nice. things I like to do. Yeah, <laughs> this is really cool, man. Thanks for coming on and, and telling us your story. Um, it's just yeah. it's it's good for for everyone to to hear how people have navigated. There's there's uh, there's certainly challenges in this space, but there's also big win opportunities, and yeah, and it's, it's a really fun it's a really fun business to be in for sure. So, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. We would love to uh, chat with you again in the future. Get some updates yeah. on, on where you are. Um, I'm sure there'll be there'll be something new that's going to change everything down the pipeline again. It won't be. Hopefully, yeah. it's not a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, hopefully something a little better. Yeah. <laughs> something else is gonna come in and, and create a shift for sure. But uh but yeah, it was it was great to hear your story. So we will we'll catch up with you again uh here soon. So thanks for coming. Um everybody, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you love content like this, if you want to hear really neat stories of other other entrepreneurs out there who are navigating this space talking to experts in, in uh, all areas of e-commerce. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you listen to your podcasts on. If you like the live streams, make sure that you're following Solozo's Facebook page, LinkedIn page, and our YouTube channel. We go live almost every day with really cool people like Michael sharing their stories. Uh, so make sure you're following us on all those. Additionally, if you are currently selling on Amazon and advertising is a struggle or it's taking up all of your time, Solozo is here to help. We have an automated platform that can help automate and optimize your campaigns for you towards your goal. Uh, and Chris and I would love to talk with you and show you how it does that. You can go to solozo.com. You can book a demo. We'll walk you through the platform. We'll talk anything Amazon. Obviously, we love doing it. So we'll talk about any challenges you're having um, or any successes. We'll talk about whatever. So solozo.com, book that demo. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. We will see everybody next time.